Welcome to another installment of Donning the Armor. We will begin today in Genesis chapter 20, verse 1. And Abraham journeyed from there to the south and dwelt between Kadesh and Shur and stayed in Gerar. So following the destruction of the plain at Sodom and Gomorrah, he leaves the area of Mamre and travels south. Um, possibly because with the destruction of the plain limits the grazing opportunities for his livestock. But regardless of what the reason is, he goes south. Now Abraham said to Sarah, his wife, she is my sister, said of Sarah's wife, she is my sister, and Abimelech, the king of Gerar, sent and took Sarah. Now we've seen this before, and it's pretty insane because she's like 100 years old. But God came to Abimelech in a dream by night and said to him, Indeed, you are a dead man because of the woman whom you have taken, for she is a man's wife. But Abimelech had not come near her, and he said, Lord, will you slay a righteous nation also? Did he not say to me, she is my sister? And she even she herself said, he is my brother. In the integrity of my heart and innocence of my hands, I have done this. So Abimelech saying like, whoa, hold on a minute. Like, I haven't even touched her. Like, they both just said this. And I've done nothing. Like, they deceived me. And I haven't done anything. Please, like, have mercy. And all of this was done in a completely innocent way. I, I have not done anything. And God said to him in a dream, yes, I know that you did this in the integrity of your heart. For I also withheld you from sinning against me. Therefore, I did not let you touch her. Now, therefore, restore the man's wife, for he is a prophet, and he will pray for you, and you shall live. But if you do not restore her, know that you shall surely die, you and all who are yours. So God's saying, look, um, yeah, I, I affected you, and I took the ability for you to touch her away. And now, therefore, give her back to her husband and then he will pray that you are saved. And if you do not, well, then you are no longer innocent. You will have chosen to go against my wishes and that will be your condemnation. So Abimelech rose up early in the morning, called all his servants and told all these things in their hearing. And the men were very much afraid. And Abimelech called Abraham and said to him, what have you done to us? How have I offended you that you have brought on me in my kingdom a great sin? You have done deeds to me that ought not be done. So Abimelech's going, hey, what did I do to you? Like, how have I offended you that you would even do this to me? Like, I didn't do anything for you. I just welcomed you in. Then Abimelech said to Abraham, what did you have in view that you have done this thing? Like, why did you do this? And Abraham said, because I thought surely the fear of God is not in this place and they will kill me on account of my wife. For, but she indeed, but indeed she is truly my sister. She is the daughter of my father, but not the daughter of my mother. So she is his half sister and she became my wife. And it came to pass when God caused me to wander from my father's house that I said to her, this is your kindness that you should do for me in every place, wherever we go, say of me, he is my brother. So he's saying, look, when people don't fear God, they do wicked things. And I thought the wicked thing they would do is kill me on account of my wife. Which is when you think about how beautiful Sarah must have been, because she is 90 plus years old. And people are still willing to say, no, she is so beautiful. I want her as my wife. Even though she is old enough to be people's great grandmother at this point. And in a way, they weren't lying. She is, they are half brother, half sister. So, but it's also not a kindness to ask your wife to lie for you. So, all of that gets mixed in. Then Abimelech took sheep, oxen, and male and female servants and gave them to Abraham, and he restored Sarah, his wife, to him. And Abimelech said, See, my land is before you. Dwell, dwell where it pleases you. Then to Sarah he said, Behold, I have given your brother a thousand pieces of silver. 
Indeed, this vindicates you before all who are with you and before everybody. Thus she was rebuked. <clears throat> so basically he's saying, this shouldn't have been done. Um, This is showing that basically I am buying back your forgiveness. This is going to vindicate you. This is going to show that you were never supposed to be here and you should never have done all of this. So Abraham prayed to God and God healed Abimelech, his wife and his female servants. Then they bore children for the Lord had closed up all the wombs of the house of Abimelech because of Sarah, Abraham's wife. So he closed up all their reproductive abilities. That's what God had done. And that's why Abimelech had not been able to touch Sarah. And the Lord visited, or go moving on to chapter 21 now. And the Lord visited Sarah as he had said. And the Lord did for Sarah as he had spoken. For Sarah conceived and bore Abraham a son in his old age, at the set time of which God had spoken to him. God has a timing. He has a timing for everything. We need to wait on his timing, not expect him to act in ours, which is how Sarah and Abraham got into so much issues with some of the things they've done as it comes to pass because God made a promise. They should have just waited. And Abraham called the name of his son who was born to him, whom Sarah bore to him, Isaac. Then Abraham circumcised his son Isaac when he was eight days old as God had commanded him. Now Abraham was 100 years old when his son Isaac was born to him. And Sarah said, God has made me laugh, and all who hear will laugh with me. She also said, Who would have said to Abraham that Sarah would nurse children? For I have borne him a son in his old age. So she is taking great joy from the fact that she is now getting to be a mother, that she is getting to experience this. And she did laugh. Remember, we went over that in a prior episode that God had even asked, why is Sarah laughing? Well, she's saying God has made me laugh because of the blessings that he has provided for me. And all will hear, all who hear of this story will laugh with her because they are so old. They are well beyond childbearing years, but this is how great God's provision is and how great his love is for those who are faithful to him. So the child grew and was weaned and Abraham made a great feast on the same day that Isaac was weaned. Well, basically when he started eating solid food and Sarah saw the son of Hagar, the Egyptian whom she had born to Abraham scoffing. So she saw that Ishmael as was promised to Hagar is a would be a person with whom all people would be against that his hand would be against everyone and everyone against him so he's seeing this new son come in and he's scoffing he's teasing he's mocking at the joy that he sees around them therefore she said to abraham cast out this bondwoman and her son for the son of this bondwoman shall not be a heir with my heir with my son, namely with Isaac. So she's saying, no, look, we tried. Now you need to get rid of her. I want no, no confusion over who your heir is. It is Isaac and Isaac alone. And the matter was very displeasing to Abraham's sight because of his son, because he loved Ishmael. He didn't see Ishmael as a burden, as someone else's son, as something else. It was his son. But God said to Abraham, do not let it be displeasing in your sight. In your sight because of the lad or because of the bond or your bond woman. Whatever Sarah has said to you, listen to her voice. For in Isaac, your seed shall be called. Yet I will also make a nation for the son of the bondwoman because he is your seed. So God is actually saying, look, you listened to your wife the first time. You were mistaken to act in that way. You shouldn't have done it. You should have relied on me. But 
in this instance, your wife is correct. Listen to her because Isaac is your heir. He is going to be the one the blessings come through. I will provide, I will bless your other son, but Isaac is the one that the blessings are coming from. So Abraham rose early in the morning and broke, took bread and a skin of water and putting it on her shoulder, he gave it and the boy to Hagar and sent her away. Then she departed and wandered in the wilderness of Beersheba and the water in the skin was used up and she placed the boy under one of the shrubs. Then she went and sat down across from him at a distance of about a bow shot, which back then was probably, I don't know, about 300 feet, 400 feet. And she said to herself, let me not see the death of the boy. So she sat opposite him and lifted her voice and wept. So she knows without water, without food, they're going to die. And she does not want to watch her own son die. So she wants to sit away from him and just cry and let it happen. And God heard the voice of the lad. Then the angel of God called to Hagar out of heaven and said to her, What ails you, Hagar? Fear not, for God has heard the voice of the lad where he is. Arise, lift up the lad and hold him with your hand, for I will make him a great nation. The angel's basically just reminding Hagar of what she was already told. That your son will come a great nation. You have run out before. You have been terrified of your fate before. And I have made you a promise. And it will come true. Because this is what happens. God makes us a promise. Hagar, no different than Sarah and, and Abraham. God makes a promise. We don't see it come to fruition right away. And we go off and say, okay, it must be something else. God isn't doing this for us. So God's promises aren't going to happen, but they will. We just need to wait on his timing. He has promised us things. You know, in the book of John, at the end, Jesus tells Peter how he's going to die. He's going to be older and he's going to be crucified himself. He tells Peter how he's going to die. Then in the book of Acts, we see Peter get arrested, placed in prison. Peter's not terrified. Part of the reason he's not terrified is probably because he was already told, you're going to die at an older age. So Peter's sitting here going, I don't know how I'm going to get out of this predicament, but Jesus promised me my end is not going to be here. And he trusted in it. We need to keep our eyes on the promises of God, on what he has called us to do and what he has promised us in the future. You know, we see, we look around, we have so many people obsessed with the climate of what's happening with the world that we're going to destroy it and make it in like inhospitable to human life, uninhabitable. But God's already told us what's going to happen with this world. He has promised it through revelation. So why as Christians, would we worry? We trust in Christ. We trust in his revelation then we have nothing to worry about because we already see and know what's coming. Don't know when it's coming, but we knew, do know that it is coming. Then God opened her eyes and she saw a well of water and she went and filled the skin with water and gave the lad a drink. So God was with the lad and he grew up and dwelt in the wilderness and became an archer. He dwelt in the wilderness of Haran and his mother took a wife for him from the land of Egypt. So God had told her, he's going to be well. He's going to be a nation of his own. He's going to have descendants and princes come from him. And God provided for that. And he did grow. Now it will be true that the people that come from him will be against everyone and they will all be against him. And they will become enemies of Israel. 
but God still kept his promise. And we need to trust in that. And it came to pass at that time that Abimelech and Pichal, the commander of his army, spoke to Abraham, saying, God is with you in all that you do. Now, therefore, swear to me by God that you will not deal falsely with me, with my offspring, or with my prosperity, but that according to the kindness that I have done to you, you will do to me and to the land in which you have dwelt. So, Abimelech saying, look, um, God continues to bless everywhere you go, and we are told that God ordains the footsteps of the righteous. So this guy saying, look, uh, I don't want you to turn on me. So let's have a covenant of our own so that you won't deal falsely with me and that you won't turn on me. And Abraham said, I, I will swear it because that's not Abraham was after. Then Abraham rebuked Abimelech because of a well of water, which Abimelech's servants had seized. And Abimelech said, I do not know who has done this thing. You did not tell me, nor had I heard of it until today. So he's saying, look, I swear to do right by you, but your people aren't doing right by me in this moment. They have seized this well that my people have built, and I, I, I want it fixed. And Abimelech saying, look, I didn't know this happened. You hadn't told it to me before, but I'll rectify it today in honor of our covenant. So Abraham took sheep and oxen and gave them to Abimelech, and the two of them made a covenant. And Abraham set seven ewe lambs of the flock by themselves. Then Abimelech asked Abraham, What is the meaning of these seven ewe lambs which you have set by themselves? And he said, You will take these seven ewe lambs from my hand, that they may be my witness that I have dug this well. Therefore he called the place Beersheba, because the two of them swore an oath there. So he's saying, look, I've dug this well, my people have dug this well, and I'm going to show you by this gesture that I did it. So take these as compensation for this well that I have dug. That way your people know this is mine. Thus they made a covenant at Beersheba. So Abimelech rose with Pichal, the commander of his army, and they returned to the land of the Philistines. Then Abraham planted a tamarisk tree in Beersheba and called on the name of the Lord, the everlasting God. And Abraham stayed in the land of the Philistines many days. So as with everything that, that happens good in his life, Abraham calls on God, builds an altar, plants a tree. He does something that will be a landmark of remembrance of how the Lord has provided for him. We'll see uh, the forefathers of the faith do this time and time again. Abraham, Isaac, Jacob, Moses, Joshua, they continue to do this as a way to have landmarks so that people will know and they will remember the provisions of the Lord. So moving on to chapter 22. Now it came to pass after these things that God tested Abraham and said to him, Abraham, and he said, here I am. Then he said, now take your son, your only son, Isaac, whom you love and go to the land of Moriah and offer him there as a burnt offering on one of the mountain, which I shall tell you. Now, people will also say, why would a good and just God force Abraham to sacrifice his son? Even if he stopped them, that's got to be horrible that God would do that. Well, it says right here, God tested Abraham. He never had any intention of allowing Abraham to sacrifice his son. It was a test of Abraham's faith. Remember, no half measures. All in for the Lord. All. You know, we'll see in Kings when we eventually get there. Second Kings. Um, Elisha, before his death, goes to the king. The king is... Uh, enemies against him. And he says, okay, you will overcome these enemies. Now empty out your, or uh, fire arrows. Well, he fired three arrows and Elisha basically rebukes him for firing only three. You should have emptied the whole thing. And you go, well, how would the king have known that? 
Well, it's the difference between being all in for the Lord and not. Giving your all to the Lord, not just what you can spare. And this is what God is asking Abraham. Are you willing to give me all you have? This is your only son, Isaac, whom you love. This is your heir because you sent Ishmael away. This is your heir. I have promised you all these things. Are you willing to give me your all? So Abraham rose early in the morning and saddled his donkey and took two of his young men with him, Isaac, his son, and he split the wood for the burnt offering and arose and went to the place which God had told him. Then on the third day, Abraham lifted his eyes and saw the place afar off. And Abraham said to his young men, stay here with the donkey. The lad and I will go yonder and worship and we will come back to you. So once again, we also see third day. We'll see symbolism all throughout the Bible. Seven days, days of completion. Six days I've heard argue is the, is the sign of man. Uh, three days, Jonah's three days in the belly of the fish. Third day, Abraham reaches Mount Moriah. Three days and nights in the tomb for Jesus. Um, I wouldn't get too caught up in numerology, but, you know, there are uh, 40 days, days of testing. There are numbers that are significant in the Bible that we need to be aware of. And Abraham said to his young men, stay here with the donkey. The lad and I will go yonder and worship and we will come back to you. So he's telling his two servants, stay here, stay with the donkey, keep everything safe. But me and Isaac, we're going to go on top of the hill. We're going to go worship the Lord and then we'll come back. So Abraham took the wood of the burnt offering and laid it on Isaac, his son. And he took fire in his hand and a knife and the two of them went together. But Isaac spoke to Abraham, his father, and said, My father. And he said, Here I am, my son. And he said, Look, the fire and the wood, but where's the lamb for the burnt offering? So Isaac, perceptive, is seeing, Hey, like we we're bringing all the stuff, but we're not bringing the actual lamb for the burnt offering. Like what's going on here? And Abraham said, My son, God will provide for himself the lamb for the burnt offering. So the two of them went together. And that means a lot uh, when you stop and think about it because Abraham doesn't know he's being tested. And you stop and you wonder, what does Abraham mean in this instance? That God himself will provide the lamb. In a way, uh, Abraham is looking at Isaac and he is saying, you're the lamb. God provided you to us in our old age. And now you're going to be the burnt offering. Uh, God has provided you himself for the burnt offering. But we can also look at it and say that the burnt offering was for the remission of sins and that God himself will provide a lamb to, um, for the remission of everyone's sins to be that sacrifice because none of us were capable of it. None of us could go up on that mountain and take Jesus's place. It was only God was capable of living a sinless life in mortal flesh. Only he was capable of that. Uh, there's a lot of false teachings about that, but only Jesus lived a sinless life, period. Only he was able to because he was God. If anybody else lived a sinless life, they easily could have went on that cross themselves. And Jesus would not have had to come. The word would not have had to take flesh. Uh, when you start to develop theology, we need to look at things logically and completely. Uh, why did Jesus need to come? Why did he need to be sacrificed? What made him so special? If we believe that there are other people who lived completely sinless, spotless lives, um, then those people could have also been the sacrifice. And for them not to do so would have been incredibly sinful on their part, which makes them no longer sinless. So the two of them went up together. Then they came to the place of which God had told him. 
And Abraham built an altar there and placed the wood in order. And he bound Isaac, his son, and laid him on the altar upon the wood. And Abraham stretched out his hand and took the knife to slay his son. But the angel of the Lord called to him from heaven and said, Abraham, Abraham. So he said, here I am. And here we see Abraham did not withhold his all from God. He did exactly what he was told, exactly what he was led to do. And he was willing to give his all, everything he had for God. And he said, do not lay your hand on the lad or do anything to him. For now, I know that you fear God since you have not withheld your son, your only son from me. Once again, angel of the Lord, capital A, and Lord all in capitals in the NKJV, which shows uh, angel of Yahweh. And once again, you did not withhold your son from me. You did not withhold him from God. That you fear God you not only stand in awe of God, but you fear him who holds your judgment in his hands. You have a healthy fear of your judge, of the authority over you. And since you have given your all, don't touch him. Because that's not what you're here to do. Not really. Then Abraham lifted his eyes and looked, and there behind him was a ram caught in a thicket by its horns. So Abraham went and took the ram and offered it up as a, for a burnt offering instead of his son. And Abraham provide, called the name of the place, the Lord will provide, as it is said to this day, in the mount of the Lord it shall be provided. So as it is said to this day always means at the time the book was written, not necessarily our time. But God did offer up a ram. Now, Abraham said he would offer up a lamb, that God will provide the lamb for himself. It wasn't a lamb. It was a ram. So God will eventually offer up a lamb. He will provide that lamb for the sacrifice. But here he provides a ram. He provides the offering that Abraham is to give him. And more important, though, than the sacrifice was his obedience. Then the angel of the Lord called to Abraham a second time out of heaven and said, By myself I have sworn, says the Lord, because you have done this thing and have not withheld your son, your only son, blessing, I will bless you. And multiplying, I will multiply your descendants as the stars of the heaven and as the sand which is in the seashore. And your descendants shall possess the gates of their enemies. In your seed, all nations of earth shall be blessed because you have obeyed my voice. So Abraham returned to his young men and they rose and went together to Beersheba. And Abraham dealt in, dwelt in Beersheba. So once again, it's not a new covenant. It's a restatement of the covenant that look, you have held up your covenant again. I am promising you, I will uphold mine. And why? Because you obeyed my voice. You obeyed what I called you to do. Obedience to the Lord is what matters, not the sacrifice. The sacrifice was a sign of the obedience. Now it came to pass after these things that it was told to Abraham, saying, Indeed, Milcah also bore children to your brother Nahor, Huz is firstborn, Buzz is brother, Kemuel, the father of Aram, Chesed, Hazo, Pildash, Jidlaf, and Belul, Bethuel, and Bethuel begot Rebekah. These eight Milcah bore to Nahor, Abraham's brother, his concubine, whose name was Ramel, Rama, also bore Taba, Geam, Thahash, and Makah. You know, I think I've mentioned it before, but we come to genealogies and we always kind of, we can't pronounce these names. I know I just butchered all of them, except for Rebecca, but they're there for an importance. 
and one of those names is more important than the rest. Kemuel, father of Aram, we know Aram. We know what will become of that. But Rebekah, it's told at this time that now it came to pass after these things that Rebekah would be born. And Rebekah, of course, continues further into the narrative, into the account, into the history of our Messiah, of the Jewish people, of the nation of Israel. The genealogies lead to history. And although we're tempted to overlook them, they're always important to go through anyway. Because as we go through these names, sometimes things pop out at us and we're like, we remember that. That was important. And the key one to take away from this is Rebecca. Because we'll see further with where Rebecca comes in in the coming chapters. So, another installment of Donning the Armor in the books. I hope you enjoyed it. I hope to see you again next time. But until then, be blessed.